Revelation chapter 4, John now receives a new vision of the things that must take place after this. So this is really the part of Revelation where it's generally accepted that things are becoming prophetic. Before we get into a lot of that prophecy still, we're going to get a vision of the throne room of heaven. So John says in verse 1, After this I looked, and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Before we go too much further, I want to take just a brief minute and address the idea of what most believers call the rapture. Uh, here where John said that the voice speaking to him said, come up here. This is a point where uh, a lot of people point to this as evidence of the rapture of the church. This isn't really evidence of the rapture of the church. Uh, there's nothing to say that this come up here is directed to anyone except John. And honestly, there's no real definitive picture in the scripture of exactly what the rapture will look like. If you ask the average churchgoer, they'll probably tell you that it will be uh, what we call a secret rapture, meaning Christ will call believers to himself with very little or no fanfare, um, that those believers will maybe just vanish and be present in heaven with Christ as the rest of the world is left to figure out exactly what happened. They'll probably tell you this because that's the view found in the very popular Left Behind series. Now, could it happen that way? Sure. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. Personally, I have a couple of things that keep me from really buying into that view of that, uh, again, secret rapture. But we don't really know. There are many scholars and theologians and pastors who all fall in different camps and different areas on this topic. And honestly, I think that we'll all find out together someday. My key concern is this, that most believers seem to get their eschatology or their beliefs regarding the last things in the end times from a fictional book series more than they do from the scriptures, and that is a dangerous thing for us to do. We should always make sure that we follow the scriptures primarily. And if it isn't clear there, then let it remain unclear until God chooses to reveal it. So, to the question of the rapture, will there be a secret rapture prior to the triumphant second coming of Christ? Maybe so, maybe not. Again, scripture's not really definitive on this is exactly how it's going to happen. What we do know is believers will be reunited with Christ at some point in the future. So John is told to come up here so he can be shown what must take place after this. And then John said, immediately I was in the spirit and there was a throne in heaven and someone was seated on it. The one seated there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian stone. A rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald surrounded the throne. Now we're hitting the part of Revelation where, again, it can get really easy to get lost in the weeds and in symbols. There are a lot of people who believe that each of the things mentioned here, the stones mentioned here, um, are symbolic of certain things. Now he mentions jasper and carnelian and emerald uh, and some believe that these are representative of for example god's justice and mercy and glory we don't really know for a fact that this is the case maybe these are intended to represent those things but there isn't a lot in scripture to make that clear to us so instead we need to keep our eyes again on the true focus of this passage which is God seated on his throne in such majesty and glory and power that John is forced to stumble through these weak comparisons to earthly stones in an attempt to try to describe what he is seeing. The centerpiece of chapter 4 is not what does each stone represent. The centerpiece of chapter 4 is the glory and the majesty of the one seated on the throne. John then says that around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the throne sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with golden crowns on their heads. There is again much discussion 
as with most things in Revelation, about who these elders are. There are two really prominent theories. One, that these elders represent the church, indicated by the fact that they would seem to be uh, wearing victor's crowns. The word used here in the Greek is Stephanos, which means a victor's crown, like somebody who won an athletic competition. Um, it's not the same word used for, for example, the crown of a king uh, or, or a regal crown. So the fact that they seem to be wearing victor's crowns, they're called elders, they're seated on thrones uh, as Christ promised to the disciples, uh, to the saints, so one theory is that these may be uh, representative of the church. The other is that these are a particular type or rank of angel. And this is mostly indicated by the fact that in chapter 5, these 24 elders seem to be grouped separate from the redeemed saints and the praises offered to God on his behalf. There's again really no clear indication of exactly what these elders are. So instead, we will keep our focus on the key thing, which we'll come to in just a few verses. Whether these are angels or whether these are representatives of the church or representatives of Israel, the point at the end of chapter 4 will be the same when we see what these elders are doing. In verse 5, John goes back to description of the throne itself. He speaks of flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder came from the throne. Seven fiery torches were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal, was also before the throne. So John gives some more description, again, of just the power and majesty and sovereignty of God. He says that there's flashes of lightning and there's thunder coming from the throne. These seven fiery torches that he says are the seven spirits of God. Again, this indicating the, the perfection of the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold Holy Spirit. And then something like a sea of glass, he says, is before the throne. And again, John is attempting here to describe the indescribable, using things that he can relate to as much as possible. He goes on and says there were four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back. They were around the throne on each side. In verse 7, John says the first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Here again, there are many different theories about what these four living creatures are or what they represent. Uh, some of the theories, just to give you an idea, uh, are that these creatures represent the created order, giving praise back to God. So the lion would be uh, wild animals, the ox would be domesticated animals, uh, man would be humanity, obviously, and then the eagle would be flying creatures or birds. This begs a couple of questions. Why aren't birds included in wild animals? Uh, what do we do about sea creatures? Uh, are they wild animals or are they just not represented? Um, there are some questions with that interpretation, with that theory. Uh, some say that these are representative of aspects of God or of Christ, that he is uh, powerful like a lion, he is a servant like an ox, he became man in the person of Christ, uh, and that he is majestic like a soaring eagle. The weakness of this theory is uh, it really depends on how you interpret these animals, and maybe a certain culture doesn't think that eagles are particularly majestic, uh, or that lions are particularly uh, king-like. Another theory is that uh, these represent how each of the four Gospels presents Christ, and, and Matthew is the lion, and Mark is the ox, and Luke is the man, and John is the eagle. There is absolutely no evidence in Scripture to support that idea, and, and honestly, even those who support this idea can't agree on which animal represents which gospel. 
my personal opinion, uh, what I think is one of the best and the simplest interpretations, uh, is again that we don't know exactly why these creatures appear this way, but that they are some type of seraphim or angels. Uh, and I think in verse 8 we get kind of a reference back to Isaiah chapter 6. You can go look at that for yourself if you want. And we see in chapter and verse 8 that each of these living creatures has six wings uh, and that they're covered with eyes around and inside. And we'll see as we go further what their function is, that it's to praise God. The seraphim mentioned in Isaiah's vision of God also had six wings. With two they cover their eyes, two they cover their feet, and with two they flew. Uh, and they also circled around the throne of God praising him. So I think it's kind of a safe assumption that these are uh, some sort of seraphim, angelic beings, why they appear to John in these different uh, animal and creature forms, we don't know. And before we go further into verse 8 and really the key of chapter 4, I want to go back and highlight for us some of the things that we have seen from John's vision about God and about who he is. So we see, for example, that he is seated on a throne. We see John using these precious stones and rainbows to try to describe what that throne looks like. John speaks of flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder coming from the throne, the seven spirits of God, the, the sevenfold perfect Holy Spirit, uh, fiery before the throne, something like a sea of glass before the throne. And then we see again the 24 elders who surround the throne and the four living creatures who surround the throne each of these giving continual praise to God. Now then we'll go back to verse 8 and see the significance of why we pointed those things out. John says then of the function of these creatures and these elders, day and night they never stop saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God the Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne and say, O Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. This is the key of chapter 4, not the symbolism of what do the stones represent and what does the sea of glass represent. The key of chapter 4 is found in our theme, in the glory of God. These living creatures praise God continually because of two things, who he is and what he's done. So the living creatures we see specifically are worshiping God because of who he is. He is holy, and they repeat this word three times to emphasize it. He is the Lord God. He is the Almighty. And He is the one who was, and who is, and who is to come. He is eternal. And when we combine this, that the creatures are saying, with all of these things that John has just tried to describe, we really get this picture of a God who is so glorious, that he is almost indescribable. He is holy. He is eternal. He is so magnificent and so glorious and so beyond John's comprehension that notice there is an absolute lack of what we call anthropomorphism here. Anthropomorphism means when we ascribe uh, human characteristics to something that is not human, so, for example, in other parts of Scripture, it speaks of the eyes of God searching the earth. Now, does God, seated in heaven, have physical eyes like you and I do, with corneas and retinas and, and irises and eye color? Scripture says that God is spirit, so most likely God does not have physical human eyes like we have. So when the writer speaks of the eyes of God searching the earth, that's anthropomorphism. He's using things that we can relate to, human characteristics, to describe God. What John is seeing here 
And what the creatures are praising here in the throne room of heaven is so beyond John's comprehension that he doesn't even attempt any of that anthropomorphism to describe God as though he were human or, or appeared human. Instead, he only is able to describe the appearance of the throne with these precious stones and with lightning and thunder and, and sea of glass and a fiery spirit and these creatures who continually praise God for who he is, holy and eternal. And then the elders, John tells us, worship God for what he has done. He says that they cast their crowns before the throne and they say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and by your will they exist and were created. There is much more focus here in chapter 4 on who God is, the holy and eternal and indescribably glorious one. But in chapter 5, we will see more reason to praise him because of what he has done. So for us, when we see something like this, what is the possible application? We want to be like these creatures and like these elders. We want to recognize God for all that he is. See his glory and his power and his eternity and respond with true and meaningful and heartfelt praise. If these angelic beings spend eternity praising God for who he is and for what he's done, how much more should we who were redeemed from certain death? In the next chapter of Revelation, again, we'll see even more reason to praise and honor and glorify God. We saw some things in this chapter that are difficult to interpret, and some things that I don't think we ever will be able to fully interpret on this earth. So as we continue, let's keep our focus on what we know is true and is to come. Let's keep our focus on constantly praising and glorifying our King for who He is and for what He's done. And let's look forward to an eternity of doing the same thing in His presence. Thank you.